All right. Looks like that is everyone uh, up here to speak. Thank you for joining us today as we're just going over a community update. Um, This is from the Electric Coin Co. And this is our first community update since... um, since ZCon 3. And up here speaking with me today, I've got Josh Weihart, who is our Senior Vice President of Growth, Product Strategy, and Regulatory Relations, Stephen Smith, who's our Senior Vice President of uh, Engineering and Product Management, and then also Paul Brigner, our Head of U.S. Public Policy and Strategic Advocacy. So the format for today is we're going to be a little bit shorter. Um, time-wise, should be around anywhere from like 15 to 30 minutes. And the three you know, speakers here are going to provide their updates um, to the community on the various facets that we're all working on here at Electric Coin Co. And if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to shoot me a DM on Twitter and we can address those questions towards the end of the end of the Twitter spaces. So to kick things off, I think we have got um, Paul, Paul Brigner is going to be the first of our speakers to provide an update. Uh, Paul, I'm going to hand it off to you really quickly. Thanks, Ian. Great to be here. And uh, thanks for everybody for joining. Um, Wow, it's been a lot that has happened since our last Twitter space. It's pretty remarkable. Um, We took August off, I believe. And uh, I think generally August is a pretty slow time for regulatory and policy activity just because Congress is out and, uh, you know, they kind of take a break, at least in Washington, D.C., but it wasn't slow. It was actually uh, crazy busy, as you all know that uh, the Office of Foreign Asset Control sanctioned tornado cash in early August that led to just a flurry of activity uh, for our team on the on the policy and advocacy front. Uh, I think that uh, Ian has been sharing with, with the community all of the different activities we've been involved in and all the the uh, podcasts and Zuko has been on a few and others have been on a few. So we've just been very busy um, trying to focus on uh, that situation and and making sure that people understand where we stand on that issue. On the 14th, so just last week, we had another um, crypto breakfast, the the pretty good pancakes or pretty good policy for crypto breakfast was Wednesday. It was really a great turnout. And uh, I, this is that was the fifth one we've had, so I think we're really on a roll here of bringing together just a good group of stakeholders. And when I say that, I'm I'm referring to like academics and nonprofits and and uh, you know policymakers, of course, and just many everyone that we can think of in the policy ecosystem that has a voice and has a role. We try to bring them together. So we had, I believe, we had over seventy uh, in person and almost that many online. Um, The next one, by the way, is coming up on October 19th. It's going to be special in that it's not only our typical PGP for crypto breakfast, which is kind of like a roundtable format of updates on crypto policy. It will also be a celebration of Global Encryption Day. And uh, that is because we are a member of the Global Encryption Council. um, And... uh, and so they they do this Global Encryption Day every year on October 21st. So we're a couple of days earlier than that. Ours is on the 19th. But we will be celebrating Global Encryption Day as well. So please join. Um, you can join that remotely, even though it is a breakfast. So the breakfast is going to be the first hour. The second hour is a lot of updates and, and a meeting that you can join remotely. So Ian will be sharing that, I'm sure, with the community. Um, also on the 14th, uh, my colleague, our new colleague who works on global regulatory relations, Gary Weinstein, was on a panel, a Web3 summit that was hosted by American University and the Global Blockchain Business Council. That was a fantastic uh, panel, and that is online. So hopefully, Ian, we can share that as well with the community. Then we had a flurry of executive order reports that came out just last Friday. So uh, there's a lot of content that we're still digesting. Of course, we've, we've taken a look already, but um, there, that's something that we're, we're going to be looking at more closely and probably um, doing some follow-up with some of the agencies on those reports and, and others in the community. And then today we uh, had a new request for comment from the Department of Treasury that uh, was seeking comment on digital asset-related illicit finance and national security risks as well as 
uh, their publicly released action plan to mitigate those risks. So that's something we're going to be paying a lot of attention to and hopefully um, focusing on the benefits of having security uh, or have benefits to having privacy in a cryptocurrency for national security and, and also you know, talking about dealing with the illicit finance risks there too. So that was a ton of activity. And um, I feel like that we're just beginning a new phase of activity on the Hill and, and in DC. Uh, I don't see it stopping anytime soon. In fact, I see it ramping up. We have elections coming up very soon. We'll have a new Congress. And I think that means there will be a lot of opportunity to do a lot of education with uh, all the new people coming into DC. So we're, we'll certainly be on top of that too. And I just want to say that, you know, it's really been nice uh, to be viewed by a lot of the stakeholders in DC as uh, sometimes they say as the adults in the room. Um, I think when they talk to us at ECC, they realize that you know, we take our role in the, in the ecosystem very seriously and that we are a very mission-driven and cause-driven organization. And they very much respect that. They respect that you know, we go in and help them see things from a point of view where having greater privacy on the blockchain allows for better national security. We actually had a fantastic, very high level meeting. You know, I can't give all the details of, of these things because they're, they're off the record and private, but um, really at the highest levels of government, we had a meeting talking about these issues. And um, even though we didn't see completely eye to eye on every different aspect of the things we discussed, uh, I think there was a great deal of respect of respect for what we do and, and our positions. So uh, we're doing well and we're gonna keep up the good work. That's all I have, Ian. Awesome, thank you thank you uh, so much for the update there, Paul. I'm gonna pass it over to Josh now who's gonna provide an update on the growth side. Thanks, Ian, hey, everybody. <clears throat> um, just to follow on what, what Paul was, was talking about in terms of some of these means that, that we, some things we can talk about and some things we can't talk about um, I think there's a recognition in the, in the broader community um, and in some of these levels of government that, I mean, these are, these are conversations that have been happening for many decades as it relates to, um, to privacy, to encryption, um, to the kind of the, the nuances and, the, and uh, the, the challenges where there are many in government that um, want to figure out how to um, balance the needs of, of, uh, of law enforcement, um, but also protect the rights and the, the safety and the security of, of citizens here in the US. Um, and again, as Paul mentioned, we're not at work just in, in the US on this, but there are conversations that are happening um, around the world um, some of some of which, you know, don't always uh, go the way that we want. We saw this um, within this last week or so. Huobi announced, Huobi Global announced that they will be delisting Zcash. I think that happened today, along with uh, Dash and Monero. Um, we had a meeting with Huobi on this, and we talked to them directly. Um, it was kind of speculated on Twitter, and it is true. Uh, according to Hobie, that uh, this is a result of pressure from regulators in uh, South Korea specifically, and that Hobie has a large percentage of its customer base in South Korea, and there was a threat to the loss of its um, uh, its license and ability to operate. Um, it was specific to coins, to certain coins, and uh, these coins, like, and I'm aware of. Uh, at least one of them making arguments to Huobi and making arguments to regulators that they're that not us, but that they were a, a private, they're not a privacy coin um, and shouldn't be considered as such. Uh, but I think there's a lot of education that still needs to happen and kind of understanding uh, that privacy, privacy is a gradient. It's not binary. Um, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of engagement of understanding how the technology works um, even if we don't see eye to eye on how it should be regulated. And so uh, the work that Paul's doing, the work that Gary's doing around the world, I think is uh, very important. 
and, and extremely relevant. Um, and it, as Paul mentioned, we're seeing a kind of a lot of interest and, and recognition, both not from the not just the public sector, but also the private sector in understanding that, you know, privacy is critical for things like censorship resistance. Um, and I think maybe some of the activity with tornado cash and some other things are opening people's eyes to um, kind of the broad implications of a lack of privacy um, uh, on the, on the internet. Um, we're out there. We, uh, in, in various events and having some conversations, some of these conversations are going to be behind some closed doors and some of them out in the open. I was at a, a summit this last week for all of the founders and the DCG portfolio. Um, there were about 150 uh, people there. And a, I can't go into the specifics of the topic because that whole conference is supposed to be kind of off the record. So people were free to, free to talk and collaborate. But there was a significant interest in, um, in privacy um, and the implications of these recent actions and the interest by various governments in such a way that I have never seen before since I've been kind of in this space. So, you know, there are a lot of us in these circles that value um, privacy and value encryption and understand the implications. And there, is many, there are many in the kind of crypto ecosystem that don't. And I think that that's changing. Um, so that... Uh, that you know that whole week with those founders was incredibly rich, and I think there'll be some nice outcomes coming out as we collaborate on various um, kinds of projects moving forward. Uh, we'll also be out at, at Mainnet this week in New York City, so um, I will be there, and I think you know most of the growth team and Zuko uh, will be out in New York this week. Um, I think for the first time we're going to have a booth at a conference. And so look for our booth and come meet us there. And part of the reason we chose to do a booth now was because now is the time where people are talking about it and it makes sense. And it runs through our whole theme that you'll see in marketing and some of our materials and some of the stuff that, that's going out, um, that privacy is normal. And, and we need to have those conversations and that needs to be part of the, the narrative. And so if you're in New York, um, come find us. We're going to have a happy hour as well. I don't think it's published, but... Um, but we'd love to catch up with you, pick up your privacy as normal t-shirt and, and help us, uh, spread the word. So we'll be there. And then we may have some other events coming up. Um, I'll, I'll be in dev at DevCon in Bogota, Colombia, which sounds incredibly safe. Uh, but we'll be there. And then we may have a presence at LabBigConf as well. Um, so we are out and about and, and spreading the word that way. Um, we're also working on some other marketing initiatives. Uh, the team is working on a new Zot cash. I think we've got a lot of great, great feedback from the community. Um, we have hired a design firm. Uh, so we've hired a third party to, to help us with, with some of that and reworking some content. Um, I think you guys will love it. It'll be really great. Um, we're doing some new things with um, Cypherpunk Zero. So we've hired, uh, as an example, we've hired uh, a comic book writer to... Um, help us take zero story out in a different form. So you, you should see that kind of stuff as well. Um, and then uh, we have an upcoming, we'll do some other things in collaboration with some other projects. We have an upcoming spaces with Espresso Systems and that will, I think it's tentatively scheduled for the week after or next. So we'll get that announced and up there as well. So that's some of the stuff that we're working on on the communications and PR and, and comm side. Thanks for the update uh, there, Josh and Stephen, if you uh, don't mind taking it from here. All right. Glad glad to do so. Um, yeah, so just kind of a quick update on the engineering and, you know, kind of product management front. Um, uh, the uh, So the update's kind of in a couple forms, one about the core protocol, one about the, you know, our, our, our what we call the app side of things, which is predominantly mobile SDKs at this point. Um, on the node side, um, our most recent release is 5.2.0. It is currently about 90% deployed throughout the ecosystem as, as best we can tell. Of course, you can't definitively measure um, the number of nodes out there, but but we do have a way through looking at various seeders and, and statistics from different block explorers. So we feel pretty confident it's about 90% deployed, which we needed to have it 
almost fully deployed to realize the the full benefits of the 520 um, set of updates around performance, in particular around block propagation times, which would help with like mining pools and some of the orphan rates that they were experiencing. Um, so we're pretty we're pretty pleased with that. That's pretty uh, pretty good rollout. Um, you know, it's kind of somewhat early in the release cycle for 520. Um, we're still evaluating what we can do um, at the node level to improve performance. We're currently surveying our, our ecosystem partners to see what other um, areas they need help in, and we'll be prioritizing those to to get those addressed. We are uh, modeling a few instances where there have been increased memory utilization, specifically in processing the larger number of shielded transactions we're currently experiencing. Um, we've identified kind of three cases where uh, memory is not a leak per se, but just increased concurrent memory usage in the Zcash D node. Um, we've got a couple of fixes that we're testing for those. The third instance we're still analyzing, um, but we're confident we'll have that pinned down pretty quickly. And then we'll roll out release 530, which will be, you know, basically the memory, um, the memory, you know, let's just say a more optimized memory usage model, as well as some, some additional tweaks and fixes that have gone into the main repo since we cut 520. Uh, the major focus for engineering, however, across the board, both the core protocol team and the mobile team is on an improved sync for our mobile wallet SDKs for both Android and iOS. Um, our intent is to release our sync improvements in a couple of phases. Um, we're getting really close on the first phase, which will add some incremental improvements to sync, but, you know, as importantly, it kind of provides the infrastructure for the full set of improvements that we'll be um, eventually rolling out. So it's kind of an, an incremental release to get some improvements in the field, but then lay the groundwork for, for the second set. Um, we'll also pick up unified address support in the SDKs at that point as well. When we shifted our priority focus on scan performance, we were well down the road in getting unified address support in the SDKs. So the, the quickest path to getting an improved sync out was to build on the work that we were already doing versus pull that out, start working on a, a you know a different set of um, libraries, if you will, and then retrofit the UA support back on top of it at a later point in time. So we'll, we'll also have UA support in there. There's been a um, community submitted proposal on uh, you know changing the fee mechanism for Zcash. Uh, it's currently been assigned zip number 317, so we're, we've been looking at it for some time. We've been talking about, uh, about potential fee changes um, to kind of make usage of the chain more proportional um, to, the, to, you know, to a given transaction. The, the key thing for us on uh, any kind of change related to um, you know, fees in particular, fee mechanisms or economics, is to fully analyze its effect. Um, we don't want to create a bigger problem than we're solving. Uh, we want to make sure that we actually solve a problem. So we're kind of doing some modeling against historical transaction profiles uh, and then look at what fees used to be for a given set of transactions, what they would be under various potential new mechanisms and make sure that it is in fact having um, the, the effect that we want without unduly impacting what we would consider more, you know, typical usage of the chain. Um, so in addition to that, we're also working on some medium and longer term thoughts around scalability, um, chain growth, et cetera, how to, to mitigate some of the chain growth we've seen over the last, um, the last, you know, three months roughly. Uh, so we'll have more on that as we kind of firm up our plans. We'll get some of that out in front of the community to start socializing it and gather feedback on it. Um, quick update on the ECC and the Filecoin grants program. We set that up with the Filecoin Foundation uh, some time back. Um, happy to report we've got our first uh, grant that we've approved through that. It's uh, with a group called Xerox Park, um, who recently just conducted a two-month-long uh, Halo 2 learning group, um, which was incredibly successful. Onboarded about 20-something developers uh, that were previously... Um, not working with Halo 2, who are now, you know, doing some projects and onboarding and are actually submitting 
some, um, you know, in some cases, optimizations or additional capabilities back to Halo 2. So that's been a huge success, but they applied for a grant to kind of continue that type of effort to continue to run a Halo 2 working group, provide developer assistance, develop learning resources and things of that nature for Halo 2. So really excited to have, um, you know, have, you know, one, a, a grant running under that program in general, but then number two, Xerox Park is a great group um, in general, and we really appreciate them leaning in on Halo 2 and, and you know, helping proliferate it throughout the larger ecosystem. Um, so, yeah, so anything, anyone, um, if you have an idea of something that would be jointly beneficial to Filecoin and, um, and Zcash, we'd love to have your submission. Um, there's a number of things we'd like to fund. Um, but we're also absolutely open to to anything. We realize that, you know, innovation occurs in ways that we might not normally think of. So anything you could think of, um, you know, that would be of benefit that you're interested in working on, please let us know. Um, and, yeah, just kind of to wrap it up, we're also uh, we're also doing some hiring uh, at ECC. Um, we've had a, a role open for a while for developer relations lead. Um, so still looking for someone in that role. It'd be kind of a hybrid, um, you know, as the name implies, working uh, with our developer communities, but then also, you know, kind of uh, spearheading some updates to our documentation, both on the the core protocol side as well as the mobile the mobile side as well. So, um, yep, looking for that person, and then also, um, we're we're always looking to to add engineers to our our core protocol team. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have you know, blockchain based experience, or you don't have to be a cryptographic researcher, or even a protocol developer, just, you know, super solid professional software engineering skills are are perfect um, for what we're looking for. You know, I mean, if you have C++ experience, Rust experience, or Go experience, that'd be awesome, but you don't necessarily have to have any of those. Just some incredibly solid programming skills would be perfect. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it for me, Ian. I don't know um, anything else you wanted to cover, but I think that was kind of the topics I wanted to get through today. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for that uh, update there, Stephen. And then we only had one question from the community come in and going to let Josh grab the answer to this. The question is, outside of the recent grayscale filings, are there any indications that the SEC may consider Zcash Zek a security? And Josh, going to let you take that one. Yeah, this is super fun one. <laughs> Um, so a couple of things like, so that I think this is related to a report that came out on Coindesk uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I encourage you to like, if you're really interested in the topic, dig in a little bit more, Re this is related specifically to a form 10 filing from Grayscale. And it's not a new filing. It's a filing that's been out there. Um, some language tweaking that they made in the filing, um, as part of that process is a fairly normal process. Like, I can't speak for Gary Gensler. I can't speak for the SEC. Um, he's made some broad statements about what may be a security or not a security. And I think part of the some of the criticism of the SEC, SEC has been is, is um, a lot of confusion um, and lack of clarity on what uh, what he means or what the SEC means as it relates to security. There's, a, there's actually a great podcast, if you're interested, um, it was on Odd Lots uh, this week, and it was Senator Pat Toomey um, talking about the state of crypto, crypto regulation. And he gets into this topic a little bit as well in terms of how some lawmakers are thinking about, um, uh, you know, this topic and the challenges with this kind of technology um, and what's happening here and some challenges as it relates to or some differences of opinion on how we ought to be thinking about this. And so... Um, I think this is a broad, this is a, a th you know, the, the, the question I, again, perceive is specific to something that Coindesk uh, wrote about that stirred up some FUD, but again, is, is not new news. And um, as well as just this kind of broader industry confusion about um, how these things should be, you know, thought about and, and regulated. So um, I hope that answers your question, but. Um, I guess the short answer to your question is, is no, there aren't anything new um, that, uh, that I'm aware of. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for that answer there, Josh. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending the spaces today. This has been recorded, so I'm going to be sharing this recording out with the TLDR 
a thread on everything we discussed today. Going to share that out on all the community channels. And if you have any questions, post the spaces. Uh, feel free to let me know via Twitter. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, everybody. See ya. Yep. Thank, thank you all.